Imagine being born into a life of luxury and privilege, yet spending your childhood battling illness and seclusion. While other kids were out playing and having fun, you were poring over financial statements and analyzing market trends. This was the reality for John Pierpont Morgan, the man who would go on to amass immense wealth, power, and influence. But John's journey to success was not an easy one. Stricken with rheumatic fever, his father sent him away to the remote Azores Islands in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to recover. For nearly a year, John lived alone, far from his family and the comforts of home. Yet, it was this isolation that would later shape his character and prepare him for the challenges that lay ahead. By the age of 19, John had studied in Boston, Switzerland, and Germany, and was ready to begin his professional career. Little did he know that the skills he had honed during his lonely days on the Azores Islands would prove invaluable in the world of finance and business. Join us as we delve into the fascinating life of John Pierpont Morgan, a man whose legacy still reverberates through the world of finance today. John's father's connections helped him land a job on Wall Street in a banking firm that looked after George Peabody and Co.'s interests in America. Despite concerns about John's temperament, he left the safety of an established firm in 1861 to found his own company, acting as an agent for his father's bank in England. In the same year, John married Amelia Sturgis, but their happiness was brief as Amelia's health rapidly declined due to tuberculosis. John took her on an extended honeymoon in the Mediterranean, hoping to restore her health, but she passed away just four months after their wedding, leaving John a young widower. After the tragic loss of his wife at a young age, John London became deeply engrossed in his work. The outbreak of the American Civil War in 1863 meant that John was liable to fight, but he paid $300 to be exempt from enlisting and arranged for a substitute to take his place. Despite not fighting in the war, John profited significantly from it. He financed the purchase of 5,000 Hall carbon rifles from the government for $3.50 each, which were then sold back to the government for $22 each, resulting in a massive profit. While this war profiteering was not well received by the public or the government, it was just the beginning of John's controversies. In 1871, John teamed up with prominent financier Anthony Drexel to establish Drexel, Morgan & Co., a private merchant banking house that eventually became J.P. Morgan & Co. This firm would be John's life's work and a precursor to the modern-day banking giant J.P. Morgan Chase. At the beginning of his career, John acted as a facilitator, connecting investors and entrepreneurs together for a fee. However, as he gained more wealth and notoriety, he started financing projects himself. One of John's first significant investments was in the American railroad industry. Unlike other industries such as steel and oil, which were dominated by a single magnet, the railroad industry had numerous competing companies that offered similar routes. Rather than seeing this as a disadvantage, John saw an opportunity to consolidate the industry by merging the railroads together. He believed that the bigger the business, the greater the benefits from economies of scale. Therefore, John's goal was to transform multiple small companies into one powerful conglomerate. To achieve this, John invested heavily in several railroads, which he then consolidated by streamlining their management and operations. By creating a unified conglomerate, John was able to set prices as he pleased, eliminating price competition and crushing remaining competitors. In this way, John expanded his empire and became a dominant player in the railroad industry. John's innovative business strategy was so successful that it became known as Morganization, which involved consolidating multiple small companies into one larger conglomerate. However, John didn't just stop at purchasing shares and making profits. He took a much more active role in managing the companies he invested in. He used his position on the boards of directors to reshuffle leadership and create monopolies with himself at the helm, refusing to help unless given full control. This not only gave John the power he desired, but also stabilized the industry and attracted investments from Europe, further increasing his wealth. John's thirst for control and power drove him to constantly acquire more rail line and set new records. He purchased 250,000 shares from William Vanderbilt and took part in the largest transaction of railroad bonds ever made in the US, underwriting $40 million to complete the Northern Pacific Railroad. Eventually, 
John owned one third of all roads in America, a remarkable feat in a time where the majority of the stock market capitalization was comprised of railroad companies. To put it differently, John had progressed beyond being solely a wealthy financier and had become a significant force in the organization and consolidation of railroad conglomerates. He played an active role in reorganizations and mergers, which only served to increase his power and wealth. His reputation as a formidable industry titan was matched by his imposing appearance. John's nose was afflicted with rosacea, a condition that caused blood vessels to inflame and rupture, and rhinophema, which made his nose larger and covered in pimples. John was incredibly self-conscious about his appearance, and he detested being photographed. When he did have his portrait done, he always requested the artist to make his nose appear more normal, which is why it's not as noticeable in photos of him. Nevertheless, his striking facial features, towering stature, and confrontational manner made him an intimidating presence. In 1901, John encountered someone who seemed willing to challenge him, President Theodore Roosevelt. John had recently merged his Northern Pacific Railroad with two other rail companies, forming the massive holding corporation, the Northern Securities Corporation. He had gotten away with monopolistic practices thanks to this close relationship with President William McKinley. But when McKinley was assassinated, Roosevelt became president and viewed John's actions differently. Roosevelt ordered the Justice Department to file a lawsuit against the company for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Despite John's efforts to fight it in court, the company was eventually dismantled. This was only the start of a tense relationship between the two men. John's ambition for control and power drove him to actively participate in the management of companies, reshuffling their leadership to his liking and creating monopoly, which gave him the power he craved. He refused to assist railroads unless he was given complete control, creating a more stable industry that attracted investments from Europe, further increasing his wealth. He constantly pursued new acquisitions, outdoing his previous achievements, such as purchasing 250,000 shares of stock from William Vanderbilt and executing the largest railroad bond transaction in the United States history to finance the Northern Pacific Railroad's completion. At a time when railroad companies accounted for 60% of America's stock market capitalization, John owned one-third of all roads in the country, shaping railroad conglomerates and continuously growing his power and wealth. His reputation as a titan of industry grew alongside his intimidating appearance due to his skin condition, rosacea, which made his nose very red and disfigured, and rhinophema, which made it larger and covered in pimples. Despite this, John never let his appearance hinder his drive for success. John's most significant business deal was acquiring Carnegie Steel from Andrew Carnegie, who was ready to retire and sell his company for $480 million, which was more than any other business deal in history at the time. Although John agreed on the spot, he later confessed he would have paid $100 million more. While his dominance in the steel industry faced a small setback due to a lawsuit filed against his company for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, it did not stop his ambitions for control and power. In 1901, John consolidated his railway business and created the Northern Securities Corporation. With President McKinley's support, John was able to engage in monopolistic practices. However, McKinley's assassination led to Theodore Roosevelt taking office, and he ordered the Justice Department to file a lawsuit against John's company for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. The company was ultimately split up, leading to a tense relationship between the two men. John was a successful businessman in America in the late 19th century, having dominated the oil industry and two-thirds of American steel production. In 1893, America faced a depression that caused a decline in the economy, with stocks plummeting, businesses closing, and unemployment rates skyrocketing. John came up with a plan to form a private syndicate to help America's gold reserves. His syndicate purchased $65 million worth of 30-year gold bonds using 3.5 million ounces of gold, immediately calming the volatile financial market and restoring faith in the economy. John Pierpont Morgan, who can also be called one of the most controversial and influential figures in American history, played a critical role in stabilizing the U.S. economy during two of its most significant financial crises. In 1907, the country faced a deepening financial crisis that led to several banks on the verge of bankruptcy, causing widespread panic 
and people queuing up to withdraw their money from their bank accounts. President Roosevelt turned to J.P. Morgan for help, despite their often conflicting views, to save the country from falling into a depression. John's strategy was to invest in the smaller competitors of failing banks and call upon dozens of leading financiers and bankers to join him in his private library to decide on the best course of action. His associates deposited large sums of money into these banks to pay to depositors and avoid bankruptcy. Despite suffering from a terrible cold, John negotiated the rescue plan that ultimately worked and restored public confidence in the banking system. However, this led to increased scrutiny of wealthy businessmen who wielded too much power and influence. John was summoned to testify before the Pujo Committee to investigate the true reach of Wall Street's money trust and its role in the American economy. During the hearings, John became the face of Wall Street power, which further added to the public's negative portrayal of him. Despite his financial success, John's mental state deteriorated and he suffered multiple nervous breakdowns. He struggled to deal with the public's negative portrayal of him in the media. Ironically, he was supposed to board the Titanic for its maiden voyage, but due to health issues, he pulled out at the last moment. John's death on March 31, 1913, while on vacation in Rome, meant that he would never see the repercussions of the Pujo Committee's investigation. After John's death, his son took over the business, and it continued its expansion. The bank has undergone countless acquisitions and mergers over the years, making it the biggest bank in the world by market capitalization. However, there are still concerns that the bank is too powerful. John's legacy lives on, and he remains a controversial figure in American history. Nonetheless, his achievements paved the way for the establishment of the Federal Reserve, realizing that the American economy could not rely on a handful of ultra-rich and powerful individuals to fix it. Single-handedly stabilizing a whole economy, well, that sure is impressive. But do you know what's more impressive? The fact that there are 100s of more such stories out there, and we're here to cover them all for you. So tune in to the next video, hit that like and subscribe button, and see you next time.